This video is made in partnership with Cheddar. This isn't happening. It's already happened. Me talking to you, the words coming out of my mouth, you hearing them. It's all in the past. Because it takes just a split second for the signal to travel from the ear to the brain through your nerves. And then it takes another split second for the auditory cortex in your brain to figure out the patterns in that signal before sending it to the language center, which takes another split second to assign meaning to the words before it sends it to the prefrontal cortex, which takes another split second to assign meaning to the entire statement and actually let you know what it is that I'm saying. By the time you perceive something, it is an event that is already in the past. And the past doesn't exist. Everything is memory. That might sound like semantics, and to be honest, it is a little, but also it isn't. Everything we experience is informed by the memories that we hold. At the simplest level, if I showed you a video of a forest and you didn't know what trees were, if you had no concept in your long-term memory of what trees were, you'd be baffled. But because you do, you know that these are just a bunch of trees and instead of focusing on them, you would focus on the guy on a unicycle in the foreground. Our minds are constantly in a combination of three different states, a memory in the present moment and in an imagined future. If you're taking a walk, you're simultaneously moving your body, connecting to the ground in the present moment, imagining the future, whether it be the next step or the next block. And at the same time, you may be reminiscing about your childhood. And in both of those states, whether you're accessing a memory from the past or imagining something happening in the near future, they both access the same part of the brain, the sensory cortex, the visual cortex. In an MRI scan, they light up just the same. You don't have memories. You have imagined memories. We often think of a memory as a tape that plays back, or a hard drive, a type of storage, but every time you remember something, your brain kind of reassembles it from whole cloth. What you're actually remembering is the last time you remembered it. Do you ever hear a song and it makes you think of the last time you listened to it, in the car, at the drive through You're remembering the last time you remembered it, and incorporating new information into that memory. This is why eyewitness testimonies are so unreliable in court, because they're not just accessing a piece of evidence. They're translating into words a possibly traumatic sensory experience that's just a copy of a copy of a copy maybe a dozen or a hundred times over. There are just so many places for new information to sneak in there. Our present sensory experience, the now, as it were, is itself just a trick of perception. Our brains take in signals from our light collectors and our air pressure sensors and our temperature and touch receptors, and it combines all those to create an experience of the most recent slices of time that have just passed. Now that doesn't mean that what you're perceiving isn't there. Of course it's there. It's just saying that the object that's doing the perceiving, the brain, can't do it directly. The sensory experience your brain creates is just an imagined perception of reality. But even future events, imagining things that haven't happened yet, are based on memory. If you're about to go into your bedroom, you picture in your mind the room before you actually enter the room. What are you gonna do there? Are you gonna go to bed, get something off the table, turn on the TV? Your brain pictured that before you did it. And that picture came from where? The mental blueprint that's in your memory. Even future events rely on memory. The brain's ability to create a perceived sensory experience, this consciousness, is kind of its default mode. It can't not do it. If your brain's even half awake, it'll find a way to create a conscious sensory experience. And if it doesn't have any sensory stimuli to create that experience out of, it'll just make something up. That's what dreams are. As you sleep throughout the night, your brain waves fluctuate between beta, delta, and theta waves, which infer deeper and lighter states of sleep. The lightest state of sleep being REM sleep, the one that creates dreams. Basically, your brain is half awake. It just hasn't turned the senses back on. And without any sensory stimuli, the perception machine in the mind just grasps at straws and constructs an experience out of it. And the reason why dreams feel so real is because your brain is pulling sensory stimuli from memory. Even dreams are memory. And the craziest thing is, biologically, we have no idea what memories are. I mean, we got a good handle on the structure of the brain, the different cortexes, how they communicate with each other and that sort of thing, but how electrical pulses going from neuron to neuron creates an image of a dinosaur walking through your grandmother's house. We have no idea. In fact, just hearing that, you're probably able to perfectly stitch together an image of a T-Rex or Velociraptor or some other dinosaur walking through your grandmother's living room. 
You can probably picture the color of the door, the pictures on the wall, the hallway to the left. You can maybe even feel the table fan blowing on you and smell the furniture. Maybe you were even able to see the scales in its skin, the color of its eyes, the wear on its teeth, the way it moved its head around. When you think about it and you break it all down, it was probably a very detailed picture. You created all that from memory. But the point is that memory of the door, the image of that room, where did that come from? How does the firing of electrical signals across cells create that? We have no idea. Throughout history, we've had a pervasive belief that reality isn't what we think it is. From religious belief that this is only a transitional world before we cross into the actual spiritual reality to the belief that we live in a vast computer simulation. We are skeptical creatures. Like Neo at the beginning of The Matrix, we can't put our finger on it. We just know that something's not right, something doesn't connect. Try as we might, it's a feeling we can neither justify or dismiss. Maybe that's because we are living a simulation of some sort. A simulation created by our own brains in a matrix of neurons. In Plato's Allegory of the Cave, Plato imagines a group of prisoners bound in a cave their whole lives who've never seen the outside world. The only clue the prisoners have about the outside world is the shadows projected on the wall of people passing by. After a while, they come to form ideas about the outside world based on these shadows. They find patterns in the shadows and learn to make predictions about when certain shadows will appear and what they'll do. They feel like they have a good beat on things. Then one day, one of the prisoners escapes. He leaves the cave, sees the reality of the outside world, that the shadows are just people like him that light and all the life that falls on are caused by the sun. He experiences rain, sees the stars, and realizes that the world is not what he thought it was. When he returns to the cave to tell the others about what he's found, of course, they don't believe him and call him a liar and a fool, that obviously this world is what they've believed it to be this whole time, and he was simply spiraling into madness. What Plato is saying with the allegory of the cave is that if you rely on your senses to understand the world, you're not really getting reality, you're only getting a projection of reality and the leaving of the cave to find truth, to him, is a journey through philosophy. Today we pursue truth through science, not philosophy, but the same holds true. Our senses lie. Our senses tell us that the sun goes around the earth and that the only light is the visible light that we can see. Through objective analysis and the tools of science and methods of science, we now know that neither one of those are true. Couldn't be further from the truth. Yet still we rely on this shadow of reality projected by our brain to inform our worldviews and our beliefs, beliefs that we incorporate into our very sense of self. We attach beliefs to our egoic selves so strongly that, again, in MRI scans, if you attack a person's belief, their brain lights up just the same as if you were attacking them personally or if you were attacking somebody that they loved. We braid and weave these beliefs into our sense of selves to the point that they become one and the same. We fully identify with our beliefs. To the point that if you were to ask the brain to remove a belief, it would be just about the same as trying to remove an appendage. A belief that is based entirely on an imagined reality, fed by memory from a past that doesn't exist. Our world is 7.6 billion shadows on the wall. 7.6 simulations interacting with each other in a chaotic system we call civilization. Economics is the study of the patterns, the value systems, and the emergent momentum created in all this randomness. A better understanding of the economy gives you a better understanding of who we are as a species and where we're going. And that's why I'm happy to partner with the YouTube channel Cheddar for this video. Cheddar creates videos that cover business, technology, and media, and the news, and they cut out all the boring stuff, so you can keep up with the current trends, without falling asleep. You can bounce from a video about the electric car maker Lucid Air, to the demise of Movie Pass, to the rise of electric scooters, and even the Bermuda Triangle. They explain interesting topics that give you a better perspective of the world you live in. If you'd like a taste of cheddar, see what I did there? You can start with this video about how empathy can prevent a robot uprising. I'll put it right there, and if you like that video, you can go check out some of their others. They've got some really great content, I recommend them. Big thanks to the Answer Files on Patreon that are helping to get the lights on around here and are just forming a really awesome community and I'm really enjoying some of the stuff that's going on over on the Patreon page. Some of the new people that have joined, I want to give them a shout out real quick. We got Nick Mills, Revel Aiden, Dominic Fabulique, Floundericious WA, <laughs> Michael C.W. Burke, Troy Goody, uh, Thomas Flanagan, Steve Bondi, and Press Shank. Thank you guys so much. If you would like to join them and get access to cool stuff like they do, then you can go to patreon.com slash answers with Joe. T-shirts available in the store, answers with Joe.com slash shirts. Uh, please do like and share this video if you liked it. And if this is your first time here, please check out some of my other videos here on a computer, down there if you're on mobile. And uh, if you like those and you like some of the topics I talk about, please consider subscribing because then you can be first in line to see all my videos every Monday. All right, thanks so much you guys for watching. Now go out there, have an eye-opening week, 
and I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.